Well, good morning. I hope everybody is having a good morning. Mine started a little rough, won't lie. Uh, had some things pop up that had me a little stressed out, but uh, I am plugging on ahead, and it's good to be here with you. You know, um, given everything that's gone on this past week, I expect that probably some of you, if you're like me, have had several moments of frustration or maybe even despair. But um, the lesson today, I hope, will help us with that. You know, sometimes in life, things don't always go the way we'd like them to. But when we have God, we have something that is sure and steadfast, that regardless of all the different factors swirling around us in our lives, we can rely upon. I want us to begin our lesson by looking at an account here in Matthew chapter 8. Verse 23 there, it says, When Jesus got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But you notice the next sentence there. It says, But he was asleep. Isn't that crazy? I've never been out on a boat in the middle of a storm, but I've been on boats where the water was at least kind of rough enough to where you're kind of like, okay, maybe I need to hold on to something. <laughs> you know? I can only imagine how terrifying it must be to be out on a ship in the middle of a you know, large body of water when a storm arises and you've got waves that are, you've probably seen videos of it or seen scenes like that in a movie or something where you see the waves coming up and just almost looks like they're just going to swallow the ship whole. And this is more or less the situation that has arisen here with this boat that Jesus and his disciples are on. Yet despite all that that's going on, Jesus is sleeping. Well, how in the world could you be sleeping through something like that, right? I mean, you look at the state of his disciples, you continue reading there, verse 25, his disciples came and they awoke him and they said, Lord, save us, we're perishing. <laughs> How can you be asleep? But he said to them, why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. And he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled. They said, well, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? The title of our lesson today is Inexplicable. I'd heard that word several times, and I always thought it was a made-up word because the first time I think I ever heard it was in the routine of a particular comedian, and I thought he was just making up a funny word. But then I actually looked it up, and I said, no, that's... That's a real word. And it just basically means something that's unexplainable, something that goes beyond reason. And sometimes we have things happen in life where we feel like, well, that's inexplicable. How in the world could that have happened? How can we make sense of this? But I want us to think about something this morning that truly is inexplicable. And that is the peace of God that can be ours. And it's described this way in the scriptures, that particular word's not used, but the idea that it's a peace that passes understanding. Uh, it is described that way because truly there are times in life where if you take the average human being and you put them in that particular scenario, you're going to have someone who is stressed out, someone who's panicked, someone who is fearful of their life. For example, just the scenario that we saw there in 
the passage that we read, where you've got this ship on the sea, and it looks like this storm is just going to completely destroy the boat, and everyone on board is going to perish. You put the average person in that scenario, and they're going to be doing just what the disciples were doing, right? Panicking. But then you also have Jesus on that same boat in that same scenario, and he's fast asleep. As relaxed, we might say, as, as we could get. Think about when you've had a real deep sleep and just how rested you feel when you wake up and how at peace you feel. Despite the storm, Jesus had peace. And we know, of course, the reason was, well, he's the one that created the winds and the waves. And as he demonstrated, he has the ability to tell them to be quiet, be still, which he did. But what that tells us is that if we have Jesus in our life, then we don't need to panic when it looks like things are not going the way we'd like them to, when Maybe we fear for our lives even. Or maybe as we think about things that are happening currently, we, we fear for the future. Maybe we're thinking about our children and the kind of world they're going to grow up in, that kind of a, an idea, and we, we become fearful and worried. But I want us to take comfort this morning in knowing that in Christ we can have a peace that is truly beyond understanding. The main question we're going to look at this morning and do our best to answer in accordance with what the scriptures teach is how can I be at peace no matter what? Whether it's good times or bad times, no matter what the situation is, how can I have this inner peace? You know, do I need to take up meditation? Do I need to start doing yoga? You know, there's all these different things people do to try and gain this inner peace, right? Well, I believe there's a passage in the Bible that really gives us a plain answer to this question. And that's found in Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to look specifically at verses 4 through 9. It's going to be kind of the main text that we're going to come back to throughout the lesson. So we'll read that together now. Philippians 4 and verse 4. It says, Rejoice! In the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. As you think about this passage and what is highlighted here, obviously uh, the central question that he's seeking to answer is, well, how can we have this peace, this peace of God that surpasses all understanding as he describes it there? Well, I think one of the things that should jump out at us, maybe if more so than anything else, is this idea of thankfulness. I'm sure you probably noticed that as we read through it together. How can I be at peace no matter what? Well, step one, be thankful. Because no matter how dark the day, how difficult the season, we have a lot to be thankful for. You notice some specific sections there as we come back and look at it, which I've highlighted here. Starting in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord when times are good. No, he says, do it always. That means good days, bad days, and everything in between. And he repeats himself. Again, I will say rejoice. You notice that when he talks about there in 
verse 6 about this concept of not worrying about things, but taking them to God, which we're going to talk about, the idea of prayer. But he interjects there again, do so with thanksgiving. Continue to rejoice, even though you're taking these burdensome things before the feet of the Lord, laying them before him that they might be dealt with by the one who can truly do all things, even when we cannot, do so with thanksgiving. And you notice, if you think about the, the point of what is said in verse 8, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, and so on and so forth, think on those kinds of things, why should we do that? Well, it again goes back to the same purpose that he'd previously expressed. Why should we spend time meditating on all these positive things? Well, what's that do for us? It reminds us of what we have to be thankful for of the reason for which we should be rejoicing always. Let's come over here to the book of Romans in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and you start in verse 31. The question is asked, What shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. You go back to verse 1 of the chapters. You think about condemnation. What's it say there in verse 1? There is therefore no condemnation now to those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are not walking according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And so where is the one who condemns? In Christ there is no condemnation. Verse 35, he asks another question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he begins to list some possibilities. Some things that we might say oftentimes do cause a person to give up their faith. To give up their hope. To abandon God. What about tribulation? Or distress? Or what about persecution? What if a famine comes upon us? Or we find ourselves lacking basic necessities. We're dealing with nakedness or peril. Going back to the scenario there on the sea. What about the sword? The threat of our own physical life being taken from us. And he reminds us of the reality that exists for those who would follow Christ and forsake the things of the world Remember, Jesus talked about how if you follow me, then the world's going to hate you, as he talked to his disciples, because they hated me first. It's going to be the same reality for you. You're going to face difficulty. Verse 36, as it's written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, verse 37, he says, in all these things, what things? All those things that he'd listed there, tribulation, persecution, peril, and so forth. In all those things, he says, we're more than conquerors. How? Through him who loved us. I'm persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. We might think about the idea of governments, right? In that concept, principalities and powers. What if we're living under an evil regime? Is that going to separate us from the love of God in Christ? He says, no. Nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You ever find yourself struggling with being able to rejoice, come read that again. 
we have plenty of reason to rejoice, don't we? Notice the attitude. Of course, we know Paul's writing there in what we just read, but further, he expresses over here in 2 Timothy. Look there in chapter 4 and start in verse 6. And Paul expresses there, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. He recognizes that uh, the end is near for him from a physical standpoint. But he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And so notice the confidence he has now as far as well, what's going to happen going forward. What lies ahead for me? He says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day. And not to me only. This isn't something that was exclusive to the Apostle Paul, but he says, it's also awaiting all those who have loved his appearing. In other words, the idea there is to everyone who will fight the good fight, who will finish the race, who will keep the faith, as he's expressed it earlier, the same awaits the crown of life. How sad it is, really, when you stop and think about it, uh, the things that we sometimes get depressed about or we get down about, we get discouraged by, how petty they really are and how silly it is that we let that consume so much of our energy when this is what awaits as long as we're keeping the faith. What else? What else do we see there in that passage that we've noticed? How can I be at peace no matter what? Well, we need to be prayerful. And I'll, I'll admit, I, I struggle sometimes with praying like I should. I really do. I, I don't know why it is. I, I guess I have to conclude that it's just Satan telling me that, well, you don't need to worry about that so much. You ever have those kinds of thoughts? Maybe you're getting ready to eat a meal and you think, well, I should say a prayer. But then you think, well, God already knows I'm thankful. I don't need to do that, right? I'll say a prayer later. And sometimes we have these silly ways that we reason in our minds as to why we don't really need to trouble ourselves with what God says we should be not troubled by, but that we should be engaged in. And prayer is really, it needs to be central to everything that we do. You come back to our passage here. Notice he doesn't say that in most things or in the most serious of things or you know the things that are really troubling in those things, go by prayer and supplication to God. No, but he says in everything. In everything. Big, small, no matter what, what it is. Let your requests be made known to God. If we want to uh, enjoy this peace of God that he goes on to describe, he says this is the avenue through which it's found. Now it incorporates, like we said, the thankfulness that needs to be ours as Christians. But this is the avenue through which we access that peace. We can be thankful and we can rejoice all day long, but if we don't ever go to God through the avenue of prayer, you know, we're missing out on the peace. It's not going to truly be there. And I would even say that if that's our methodology... <laughs> we're not really going to be rejoicing. <laughs> You're going to find that that doesn't really work. These things have to be incorporated together. Be prayerful. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, I always like that verse because it's short and sweet to the point. Pray without ceasing. Well, does that mean that I just constantly am praying? I never stop praying and no matter what I'm doing, if I'm eating and chewing up a bite of food, I need to be praying then. And if I'm blinking, you know, I need to be praying when I'm blinking. <laughs> you know, we can take that to some kind of silly extreme, I suppose. The idea there is just that it's a, it's a regular part of life for us. You know, we're thinking constantly about talking and communicating to God. It's not something that we reserve for, you know, those special occasions Oh, we pray when we come together as a church. Well, that's when we pray. Or, you know, we pray when, 
you know, we have a family get together and we're all gathered there and it's you know, special. That's when we, no, this is just, it's as routine for us as Christians, it should be, as breathing. It's just, we do it all the time. That's, that's the idea put forth here. But do we, do we behave like that? I don't. I need to. Notice what Jesus teaches his disciples over here in Luke chapter 18. You start in verse 1 there. He teaches them a parable. He spoke a parable to them that men, notice, always ought to pray and not to lose heart. He said, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, nor did he regard man. Pretty much considered himself as what the universe revolved around, we could say. And in this particular city that he presided over, says there was a widow, and she came to him and she said, please get justice for me from my adversary. And for a while, he would not do it. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, Yet, because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So, this is a completely selfish motivation. You know, he's thinking only of himself here. He's thinking, you know, this person is annoying me. <laughs> she comes every day, and I'm just getting tired of listening to her pleading. And so, for that reason alone, just for my own sanity, I'm just going to go ahead and grant her request so that she'll leave me alone. This is the, the reasoning of this person. So, verse 6, the Lord then said, hear what the unjust judge said. Here's somebody who's thinking only of himself, purely selfish motivation. Now, what's the larger point Jesus is making? Verse 7, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? You know, here's somebody who does care. You know, God is the complete opposite of selfishness, and we see that demonstrated through all that he's done for us. If the unrighteous, selfish judge is going to avenge this person just out of the fact that he doesn't want to be bothered anymore, how much more so is God who actually cares going to listen to the pleas of his people. I tell you, Jesus says, that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? In other words, the action here, the, the thing that causes God to move and to act is what? His people crying out night and day. But what if we're not doing that? This is kind of his point. You know, when Jesus returns, is he really going to find people that are actually crying out night and day and being persistent in their prayers to God? Or is he just going to find people who, well, I tried praying, didn't really seem like anything happened, so I just kind of gave up on that. You recall what James wrote in James chapter 5? Concerning prayer, right at the end of the book of James, start in verse 16. We see there, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And he cites the example of the prophet Elijah. He says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Why does he include that detail? Why does he remind us of that? Well, it's, it's important to recognize in looking at what happened when Elijah prayed, you notice he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth was able to produce its fruit. This was not some kind of uh, uber, you know, 
person following God to such a degree that you know none of us could ever attain to that. You know, this this was somebody that was way beyond our ability as far as goodness and righteousness and uh, faith in God. No, this, this was a a man, a human being, just like you and I are. And look what he was able to do because of his faith and because of his prayer to God. That's the, that's the point that he's trying to drive home. Sometimes maybe we think, well, who am I? Well, there's, there's truth to that. Uh, that's, a, that's a healthy way to think in a lot of ways because we, really, who are we? Right? We're all sinners. Think about, you know, we think about how many times we've messed it up, how many times we failed God. Why would God listen to me? What's my prayer really going to do? Well, it's going to do a lot if we're praying the right way. That's the point that James wants us to recognize here. And it's the point that Jesus wants us to recognize. Finally, how can I be at peace no matter what? We need to focus on being fruitful. And that's an aspect I think sometimes we miss as we look at the passage that we had uh, considered here in Philippians. And a lot of times I think we miss it because we kind of stop reading at verse 8 and we don't read verse 9. But if you come back and you notice verse 9 as he's talking about all these things, uh, stressing the need to rejoice, stressing the need to focus on positive things, to be thankful to God as we pray, he then says, the things which you've learned, the things that you've received and heard and seen in me, these do. And it kind of correlates back to verse 5 as well, where there he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Be active in doing the will of God. Show Christ through your manner of life, which involves obeying his commands. It's so easy when we just sit around and we're not really doing much of anything to find ourselves spiraling downward into that depression and we start focusing on everything that's wrong, uh, everything that's not the way we want it to be, and, and what are we doing to change it? What are we doing to get out of that? Well, we're not doing anything. We're just sitting there and thinking about it and worrying about it, right? When we need to be thinking about what we have to be thankful for, we need to be thanking God and taking our concerns and worries to Him in prayer. And then we need to be getting up and getting out there and doing something productive, something positive, putting into action these things that we've been meditating on, supposedly. <coughs> be fruitful. Now, I wanted to include, you notice there in the text, he says, the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, these do. Paul speaking in the first person there. Well, I thought we were supposed to follow God. Well, yeah, we are. And that's why I included 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, where Paul makes plain as he's talking about being imitators of him, he says, as I imitate Christ. You know, imitate me to the point that I'm demonstrating to you what Jesus taught. Don't do it just because I'm Paul and you just respect me so much, right? We don't emulate people just because uh, of something they've done or the goodness that we perceive in them. Any goodness, any accomplishment, obviously, always goes back to God anyway. And so the idea there as he teaches that is, is not that we're looking to what Paul said about anything, but we're, we're thinking about what Paul had taught them in accordance with the law of Christ. Now let's come over here to 2 Timothy, and let's look in chapter 2. I want to start reading there in verse 1. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1. Again, Paul writing to the young evangelist here. He says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He says, no one uh, engaged, rather, in wa uh, warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, the reason being that he might uh, please him who enlisted him as a soldier. In other words, we don't let ourselves get distracted with all these other things going on because we have a job to do. Verse 5, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all these things. In verse 8, he says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains. You know, as Paul was writing these things, he was in prison. Uh, he'd been accused of all kinds of false things because he was out there actively trying to do what was right. But notice what he says next. He says, but the word of God is not chained. I might be physically chained to a wall, but I'm not going to let that stop me from continuing to teach, continuing to shine the light of the truth of God's word because there are no chains that can bind the truth. Isn't that a powerful statement? Verse 10, he continues, he says, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, well, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, but he says, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, workers who do not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. What a powerful example. Riding from prison, riding with chains around his legs, his arms, yet this is his attitude. What excuse do we have? Let's come over here to Galatians chapter 6. Pick up there in verse 7 with me. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, beginning, he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Notice he says in verse 9, Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Keep going. Keep fighting. Even though it might look like the odds are against you, like success is further away than it ever has been, he says don't lose heart. Trust in this truth. You sow to the Spirit, you will reap everlasting life. Don't lose heart. Verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. Stay active. Stay working. Be a force for good, even when everything around you seemingly is consumed by evil. Be fruitful. As we begin to conclude this morning, I wanted us to notice the attitude of three men that we read about here in Daniel chapter 3. A story that we probably all learned as kids about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember the situation where King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon set up this golden image, this idol, and he put out this command throughout all the land that at a certain time of day, whenever... Uh, this particular music was heard, 
that everybody in the kingdom had to bow down and worship this image. But these three men, obviously, they were captives of the Israelites, and they knew the true God, and they were not going to worship some idol, even though the punishment that had been expressed was, you'll be cast into the furnace of fire if you don't do these things. Notice their, their attitude here. And I think it speaks to this peace that passes understanding that we've been talking about. Clearly, these men had that peace, or else they wouldn't have been able to express themselves in the way that we see here. They answered the king, Daniel 3, verse 16. Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. He inquired, are you going to change your mind? He reminded them of the punishment that was coming. I'm going to give you another chance to, to change course here. Because I really don't want to have to kill you. I, I kind of like you guys, but you're making me a little upset right now. So I'm going to give you one last chance to change your mind. They say, we don't even need to answer you in this matter. You should already know what our answer is. In other words, they say, if that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. In other words, if you go ahead and proceed with your plans to, to punish us in that way, we trust that God's able to deliver us from that. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king, but even not. Notice that. Isn't that amazing? Verse 18, even if God decides, no, I, I'm going to allow that punishment to actually end their physical lives, even if that's the case, let it be known. We do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you've set up. That's the kind of faith that I want to have. And that's the kind of faith I want you to have. Regardless of what comes at you in life, what kind of um, persecution we may face in the future that might threaten our very lives, this is the kind of faith that I want to have. Okay, you're going to put me to death. You're going to cast me into this, that, or the other thing. Okay, well, I trust God that He's able to deliver me, but you know what? Even if he chooses not to, I am not going to do anything against his will. I'm going to continue to be faithful to him. So you do what you will with me. It's easy to talk about that kind of faith when you're not there in the midst of the situation. It's another thing to exhibit that faith when that's what you're actually facing. And so that's a matter of personal reflection for each of us what would we actually do? Do we really have this peace that passes understanding? Are we doing the things we've highlighted this morning from the text that we ought to be doing if we want to have that true peace? Are we rejoicing constantly? Are we praying without ceasing? Are we constantly striving to do what is right and stay engaged and busy in the work of God? Do we have that inexplicable peace? I'd like to close this morning by reading one final passage. And that passage is Psalm 27. Psalm 27. We'll just read this entire psalm, 14 verses here, and then the lesson will be yours. David writes, he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies, my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, of this, in this, I will be confident. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around. I will offer sacrifices of joy 
Notice that. Isn't that amazing? Just think about all the things we've talked about. Think about how all these words just correlate so perfectly with all that we've looked at. Sacrifice of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me or forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart. Notice that. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Lesson is yours. This morning, if you're here and you need prayers, this morning, if you're here and you need to render obedience to Christ through confessing Him, through repenting of your sins, being baptized, so that you can rise, having been cleansed, to remain faithful to Him throughout the rest of your days, looking forward to that crown that we all someday can have confidence in receiving. We'd love to assist you in all these things if there is a need. And so at this time, as we stand and sing the song, uh, please let all your requests be, be made known by coming up to the front. There's a fountain